Jesus. We can hardly wait for you to come again to take us to be with you. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word, to learn about your coming, and how you want us to live until you do come for us. Lord, I pray right now that you will help us to shut out all of the busyness of this life on earth and focus on heaven, on you, and on your word. Just touch our hearts today, and we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to the Joy of Living Bible Study class. For those of you who are watching online, my name is Shelby Hunt, and we are studying Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. So will you open your Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now this is the classic chapter concerning the rapture of the church. Now, because we could meet the Lord tomorrow or today, we should be living in a way that would please him today. Now, I keep this poster taped to my refrigerator so that I will see it every day. It's titled, Rules for Today. It says, do nothing that you would not like to be doing when Jesus comes. Go to no place where you would not like to be found when Jesus comes. Say nothing that you would not like to be saying when Jesus comes. It's that last one that gets me. You know, we look forward to the day when we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But in the meantime, our feet are down here on the ground, and we need to walk in a way that will please God. Now, the Bible often compares the Christian life to a walk. It begins with a step of faith. But that step leads to a walk of faith. Now, walking suggests progress. Saved people are not to walk like unsaved people. You remember Enoch walked with God, and Hebrews 11.5 says that he pleased God. Well, we please God by obeying his commands. Now, the word commands is a military term. It refers to orders given by a commander to subordinates. Well, Jesus is our commander-in-chief, and he expects us to obey his commands that he's given to us in his word. Now, in verses 3 to 8, Paul tells us we should walk in holiness. Now, the Thessalonians lived in a society that practiced sexual immorality much like ours today. Now, God's will for us includes not only salvation, but our sanctification. Now, sanctification literally means to be set apart from sin to holiness. In this context, it means being set apart from sexual immorality in particular. <clears throat> you cannot be involved in sexual sin and please God. Now, just what is sexual immorality? Well, the Greek word used by Paul is the term pornia, from which we get the English word pornography. It is a broad term encompassing any illicit sexual activity. So just what specific sexual activities does Scripture prohibit? Well, we know that adultery is condemned in the Scripture, and under Old Testament law, it warranted the death penalty. Now, if we carried out that punishment today, the world population would be drastically reduced. <laughs> Fornication is sex between unmarried people. And we see a lot of that today with couples living together without being married. And we even see it among believers. Also condemned in scripture is incest, which is sex with a close relative other than one's spouse. And this too calls for the death penalty. Bestiality is sex with an animal, and it was punished with death. Homosexuality, which is sex with a person of one's own gender, 
is condemned in several Old Testament and New Testament passages. Now, sexual sin always hurts someone. And God has provided the gift of sex to be enjoyed within the marriage relationship. And when we step outside that boundary, somebody is going to be hurt. I'd like to read to you from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18 to 20. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now look at verse 4 in Thessalonians. The word vessel means container or pitcher. Now our bodies are earthen vessels containing the treasure of Christ Jesus. And Paul tells us we are to keep our vessels or our bodies pure. We're not to live like the heathens. Now a heathen is one who does not know God. Now Paul didn't say that the heathen do not know about God, but they don't know God personally. You see, when a person comes to know God by faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will give him or her the ability to resist sexual temptation. And then in verses 6 to 8, Paul listed three motivations for sexual purity. The first is a frank warning. He says, the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses. In other words, the Lord will punish offenders for their sins. Now, this does not mean that Christians can lose their salvation because we cannot, but that we will suffer the consequences of sinful living. If we choose to sin, we can be forgiven, but that does not change or eliminate the hurt caused by the sin. You see, the law of harvest applies to believers as well as unbelievers. We will reap what we sow. King David learned that painful truth. Then a second reason to avoid sexual immorality is that it goes against God's calling for a Christian. God wants his children to live pure lives. Third, Paul pointed out that to reject these instructions is to reject God and the gift of his Holy Spirit. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit that makes our body the temple of God. We are literally carrying Christ Jesus in our bodies. And when we sin, we grieve the Spirit of God. But if we yield to God's Spirit, He will empower us to resist sexual temptations and live a clean life. Then in verses 9 and 10, Paul speaks of another area in which we should please God, and that is in brotherly love. Brotherly love refers to love for fellow Christians. The Greek word for this kind of love is Philadelphia. Now, because Christians are brothers and sisters in Christ and have the same Father, we should love one another. If a Christian really loves his brother or sister, he will not sin against them. Now, the word Paul used for love at the end of verse 9 is different from the one he used at the beginning of the verse. Here, it is agape, the kind of love God shows toward us. Now, agape love treats others as God would treat them, regardless of how we feel about them. You know, it's hard to have a warm, fuzzy feeling for some of the saints. Someone has put that fact into this little jingle. It says, to dwell above with saints in love, oh, that will be glory. But to stay below with the saints I know, that's another story. (laughs) You know, agape love is a commitment, not a feeling. 
It's an action word. It is doing for that person what God would do. Now, when you act in a loving way, you will often find that the feeling will eventually follow. But even if it doesn't, we're to keep on showing acts of love and kindness to those who are unlovely. Then in verses 11 and 12, Paul says we should also please God by leading a quiet life, by minding our own business, and by doing honest work. Now, when Paul speaks of leading a quiet life, he's not talking about sitting around saying nothing and doing nothing. Rather, he is referring to a person who is at peace with himself and others because he is at peace with God. And such a person brings peace into difficult situations. He has a calming effect on people. Second, Paul recommended minding one's own business. You know, busybodies run around interfering with the affairs of others when they should be taking care of their own affairs. If we're busy doing the Lord's work, we won't have the time or the desire to get involved in everybody else's business. Then third, Paul said we should work with our hands. Now, this verse dignifies manual labor. Now, it's possible that some of the Thessalonians thought the Lord would return very soon, so they had stopped working and had become dependent on others. They might also have been influenced by the Greek culture, which looked down on manual labor. You see, most of the work was done by slaves. But the Jews held work in high esteem. Every Jewish boy was taught a trade regardless of his family's wealth. Remember, Jesus was a carpenter. And Paul himself set a good example by working with his hands as a tent maker while he was in Thessalonica. You see, manual labor should never be looked down upon by Christians. Failure to work to support ourselves produces an unhealthy dependence on the church and the government. It is also a negative witness to the lost world, which Paul calls outsiders. You see, believers who do not pay their bills lose their testimony with the unsaved. Now, all our business dealings should be honest, but our dealings with lost people should be scrupulously honest because they are watching us. Now, Paul has told us we should please God in the way we live today because we could meet him tomorrow. Now, in verses 13 to 18, we have the classic passage in the Bible on the rapture of the church. Now, the word rapture is not found in the Bible, but that doesn't change the fact that it is a real event that will take place in the future. Did you realize that the words trinity and mission and sovereignty are not found in the Bible either? But they are all doctrines taught in the Bible. Now, Paul had taught the Thessalonians that Jesus would return. <clears throat> and they expected him to return in their lifetime. Now, the fact that Paul used the pronoun we in verse 17 suggests that he expected to be alive when the Lord returned. He believed the Lord's return was imminent. Now, that means it could take place at any moment. Now, the Thessalonians had mistakenly thought that only those who were alive at the time of the coming of Christ would witness and share in the glory of his return. And Paul wanted his readers to know the truth about Christians who die before Jesus' return. He wanted them to be comforted by the hope of seeing their believing loved ones again. Now look at verses 13 and 14. Now the key in these verses is the contrast between sorrow and hope. Now Paul is not saying that believers shouldn't grieve or feel deep sorrow. 
This is a normal human emotion, which even Jesus experienced when Lazarus died. Several years ago, I attended, attended the funeral of a dear friend's husband, and I couldn't believe I heard correctly when her pastor said, there will be no tears shed here today. There will be no crying. I couldn't, I just wanted to get up and say, but Jesus wept when his friend died, and it's normal and healthy for us to shed tears. But we need not experience the hopeless, despairing grief that unbelievers do. Now, Paul refers to believers who have already died as those who have fallen asleep, asleep in Jesus. Now, that term is never used in the New Testament of anyone but believers. I want to read to you from John 11, verses 11 through 13. After Jesus had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. Now, you remember when Jairus' daughter died that Jesus said, She is not dead but asleep. And when Stephen was stoned to death, Acts 760 says he fell asleep. Now the early Christians adopted a very wonderful word for the burying places of their loved ones. The Greek word koimaterion, which means a sleeping place. And it is the same word from which we get our English word, cemetery. It is a sleeping place. Now, there are several reasons that the death of the body is spoken of as sleep. First, there's a similarity between sleep and death. I'm sure you've been to a funeral where someone has remarked that so-and-so looks just as if he or she were asleep. Well, in a way, it's true. The body of a believer is asleep. Sleep is temporary. A person who is asleep will wake up, and those who are asleep in Jesus will wake up to eternal life. Now, it is not the soul that sleeps. It is the body. There's no such thing as soul sleep. When a believer dies, the spirit leaves the body and goes to be with the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5.8, Paul wrote that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I had that verse engraved on Bill's headstone. When I go to visit his gravesite, that's a reminder to me that he's not there. He's in heaven with the Lord. Now, the Bible teaches that the body returns to the dust from which it was created, but the spirit returns to God who gave it. The body sleeps in the earth until it is resurrected. Now, because Jesus died and was resurrected from the dead, those who are asleep in Christ will also be resurrected. Now, the word resurrect literally means to stand up. It's only the body which can stand up in resurrection. These bodies are going to stand up again. Now, when Christ returns in what we call the rapture, he will bring with him from heaven the souls of believers who have died. Their bodies will be raised and united with their souls in a glorified body. Now, don't confuse the rapture of the church with Christ's return to the earth to set up his earthly kingdom. You see, the second coming of Christ has two phases. First is the rapture or the catching up of the church age saints. Then at the end of the tribulation, Christ will return to earth with his saints to establish his millennial reign. Now at the rapture, Christ comes in the air 
at the second coming, he returns to the earth. Now, the unbelieving world will not see Christ when he calls out the saints in the rapture. But at his second coming, every eye will see him. Now, in verses 16 and 17, Paul tells us what will happen at the rapture. Now, today, Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And when the time is right, when God the Father says, that's enough, God the Father will tell his son to get up and go down into the atmosphere, not to the earth, but in the air, and call his church to come up to meet him in the air. Now, I like the fact that the Lord himself will come down from heaven. He won't be sending angels. He himself is coming to take us to be with him. Now, three unique sounds will be involved when Jesus descends from heaven. Jesus will give a loud command, just as he did outside the tomb of Lazarus. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what Christ's command will be, but I think he's going to shout, come up here, because that's what he said to John in Revelation 4. Whatever Jesus says... All of the sleeping dead in Christ will hear his voice and come out of their graves. He's literally going to wake up the dead. Then another sound will be the voice of the archangel. Now, the only archangel who is named in the Bible is Michael. And according to Daniel 10, 13, there is more than one chief angel, so we cannot be certain that it will be Michael. Now, even though Gabriel is a great angel, he is never referred to as an archangel. So let's assume that this is Michael. Why is he involved? Well, the Bible calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. And we will have to travel through the airways to meet Christ. So I believe Christ sends Michael to make way for the saints as we meet the Lord in the air. He's going to protect us from from Satan, who does not want us to meet Christ. Then there is the trumpet call of God. Now, this trumpet is not the judgment trumpets of Revelation 8 through 11, but it is like the trumpet trumpet of Exodus 10, which called the people out of the camp to meet God. Now, trumpets were used to signal the people together. Now, the rapture will be the greatest gathering of believers this world has ever known. What a reunion. (laughs) And by the way, this verse doesn't say a thing about Gabriel blowing his horn. Now, when Christ calls and Michael comes and the trumpet blows, every graveyard will look like a plowed field. The graves of believers will burst open. And bodies will be snatched out and changed to be reunited with their souls and spirits to join Christ in the air. Now, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, this refers to church age saints, those saved from Pentecost on. Now, Old Testament saints will be raised at the end of the Great Tribulation. Now, the bodies of the dead in Christ will rise before the living believers are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Someone said the reason they are raised first is because they have six feet farther to go. (laughs) But you need to understand that when a believer dies, his soul and spirit goes immediately to be with the Lord in heaven. The body remains in the grave until the end of the church age. And when Christ calls out the church at the rapture, he will bring with him the souls of church-age believers who have already died. He will raise the body and unite body and soul into a glorified body. Now, how will God raise the bodies of people who were buried hundreds of years ago? What about the bodies of those who were burned to death and those whose ashes were thrown to the wind 
What about Christians who perished at sea? No problem. Our resurrection bodies are not our old bodies reconstructed. We're going to get new glorified bodies like Christ's body. Now look at verse 17. The word rapture is not used in this passage, but that is the literal meaning of caught up. The Greek word for rapture means to seize by force, to snatch away, to carry off speedily. Now, after the bodies of dead Christians have been raised, those believers who are still alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Neither the grave nor gravity will be able to hold us down. There's going to be a grand reunion a glorious homecoming in the sky someday. We're going to be reunited with our believing friends and loved ones who have died. And this fact brings great comfort to us when a believing loved one dies. Christians never say goodbye for the last time. When my mother passed away, the, her pastor asked this question, when you walk by Brucey's casket in a few moments... Will you have to say goodbye, or will you be able to say, see you later? And when I walked by, I said, see you later, Mother. Now, not only will we see our loved ones again, but we're going to meet Jesus face to face. We shall see him as he is. And Philippians 3.21 says he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Now, since we cannot enter heaven in our present bodies, they must be changed. Our new bodies will have flesh and bone, but not flesh and blood. Now, why not blood? From the time of Adam and Eve, God has demanded blood as payment for sin. Now, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins when he died on the cross and shed his own blood. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, he took his own blood and sprinkled it on the mercy seat of the heavenly tabernacle. God was satisfied, and there was no more need for the blood. Jesus' glorified body had no blood, and our bodies will be like his. In Luke 24, 39, when Jesus appeared to the disciples in his resurrection body, he said, look at my hands and feet. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Notice Jesus said flesh and bones not flesh and blood. His blood is in heaven where it keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now just think, if you're still alive at the rapture of the church, quicker than you can blink your eye, you're going to be snatched away. One second, you'll be going about your busy lives on earth, and the next second, you'll be in the presence of Jesus and all the saints. You won't have time to take a shower and change clothes you won't have time to get your makeup on and your hair fixed, and you won't need to because you're going to get an instant makeover and a brand new body. It won't be our old body reconstructed. We're going to get a brand new body. Our glorified bodies will be perfect without sin, praise God, or sickness or disease or pain. We will retain our personalities and others will recognize us. We're going to know each other. We'll be able to eat and sing and work. 
and we're going to have powers and abilities beyond our imagination. Now look at verse 18. The primary purpose of this passage is to provide comfort and encouragement to those Christians whose loved ones have died. Next Wednesday will be the fifth anniversary of my husband's home going. This chapter means a lot to me. There is coming a day when we will be reunited with our believing loved ones to meet our Lord and Savior and live with him forever. Titus calls this day a blessed hope. I'm going to read from John 14, 1 through 3. We can all say it from memory. But I don't trust myself to say it from memory right now. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. Jesus is in heaven preparing a place for you. Are you prepared for that place? Are you ready for the rapture? The rapture could happen at any moment. It will take place suddenly without warning. And we need to be ready. We don't need to be looking for a sign. We need to be listening for a sound. We're not looking for the undertaker. We're looking for the upper taker. When Jesus returns, the believing will be leaving. And because we will give an account to him of how we have lived, we should be concerned about pleasing him today. May our prayer each morning be, Lord, help me live in such a way that if you return today, I'll not be ashamed to see you. So ladies, we need to pray up. Look up and listen up, because we're going, we are going up. He's going to toot, and we're going to scoot. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, it's for myself, I would love for you to come in the next few minutes, but I have lost loved ones and friends. All of us here do. Thank you that you are patient that you are tarrying because to give people an opportunity to be saved. So, Lord, I pray that you would burden our hearts for the lost and give us boldness and courage to go out and tell others how they, too, can go to heaven. And then, Lord, I pray that you will help us keep our eyes on Jesus and walk in a way that will please you so that we will not be ashamed when we see you face to face. We love you. Thank you for giving your life that we might have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.